All right, let's get an idea of what's going on in equity markets at the moment, just in terms perhaps of uh, portfolio positioning at the same time. Sean Fenton joining us from Sage Capital. Sean, good to see you. Good to be here. All right, really interesting time in the markets, of course, given what we're seeing at a macro level. What's actually driving your investment decisions at the moment? Yeah, we try and take as much of that uh, macro out of the portfolio as possible. So as you say, we're in this period of great uncertainty in markets where central banks have been tightening rates to, to deal with inflation. We're just starting to see some of the fallout uh, from that. So things like baby bunting, the broader retail uh, market, starting to feel the, the pressure of higher interest rates. So the market's changing. But on the other hand, uh, we've got a lot of global markets approaching record highs. And Nasdaq's obviously caught up with a bit of AI mania. Uh, but uh, we're not really seeing the recession that uh, we've expected and corporate profits have been holding up. So the market's in this sort of interesting twilight zone where uh, the tightening's there, the pressure's there, but it's not coming through in company profits and markets are hoping, hoping for a bit of a soft landing and, and look through that, but the risks are that things get a little bit tougher. We've got to see um, some tougher medicine, higher unemployment to really get inflation back down and that could really impact uh, company profits uh, the second half going into next year. Are you trying to pick sectors or is that just too difficult at the moment? Is it sort of individual stock selection? Yeah, we, we really try and go long and short within sectors. So, um, you know, we, we break the market up into different areas like growth stocks. Um, so it might be, you know, things like CSL and WiseTech, ResMed, Zero, those sort of things. Cyclicals such as your retailers, JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, and Qantas might come in there. Resources, so, you know, all your commodity producing stocks, uh, financials, banks, insurance, etc. cetera. Um, REITs, um, defensive stocks like ASX, Telstra will fit within there. And we try and uh, you know, identify companies that uh, have the best or worst earnings prospects, relative valuation, go long and short there so that we can control that macro risk but still express a lot of views about the individual companies, what's benefiting them, who fares best through tough times or um, has the best upside to you know, recovery when it happens, etc. Well, you mentioned that defensive play, ASX, mm. of course, in the news today, mm. being hit hard. Um, what's your outlook? Is that present a buying opportunity, do you think? Uh, a bit too early for that. In fact, it's, it's one that's probably been down the bottom end of our, our rankings. For some of those issues, what we you know, really look for, even within defensives, is um, you know, pricing power at the moment. So you, know, you do see tight labour markets, pressures are coming through there. Um, areas like the ASX, as they've mentioned, increasing you know, regulatory costs. They've had, obviously, big transition issues with you know, chess, the replacement system there in terms of uh, distributed ledger, you know, blockchain technology hasn't worked, so they're back to the, the drawing board, uh, revising up their costs there. So they're not able to pass that through to their customers in terms of higher, um, higher, higher fees. Uh, and if anything, you're seeing you know, market volume and liquidity under a little bit of pressure. So they're you know, really caught in that pincer movement of um, you know, costs going up and not being able to get traction on revenue, so you know, really impacting the bottom line. And you know, it's been priced really as a defensive and a bit of a premium there. So um, there's a bit of a derating going on. So we're not yeah, rushing out to, uh, to buy ASX. You know, in that space in defensives, we'd prefer stocks like you know, Telstra, which you know, it's had its own issues for a decade or so. It's been running to stand still in terms of government regulatory change, how that's impacted um, you know, retail broadband as well as wholesale corporate uh, market share losses. But it finds itself in a position now where it's done a lot of that, it's balance sheets in improving um, and it's got some market power back in mobile again and that market's looking a lot more rational so you know both Optus and Vodafone putting through price rises as they face themselves higher interest costs more gearing on the balance sheet high capex requirements so that um, pricing power is helping to drive margins for, for mobile for so Telstra so you know, it's got optionality around some of its infrastructure the ability to spin that off um, and um, you know reasonably defensive in tough times so within that area of defensive stocks, we'd prefer something like a Telstra over an ASX. At the beginning there, you touched on you know, what we've seen, particularly on Wall Street, with tech. Mm. Uh, really narrow leadership. They're driving uh, the broader index higher, particularly in the NASDAQ. And we've seen just obviously the last mm. week what happened with NVIDIA. Um, ha has that sort of lifted tech more broadly globally? I mean, obviously, we've got a very small tech sector here. Is that something you're finding at all attractive? Uh, tech's certainly very interesting and some of the exposures that we do have here are, are doing well. Uh, as you say, it's been very concentrated, concentrated leadership, um, really reflecting the underlying profit performance and growth there as well. Um, we're probably a little bit cautious um, you know, where that goes going forward. If you look at uh, US tech, 
it's not so much tech. A lot of it's actually consumer advertising, advertising driven. So Google, you know, Apple's obviously a consumer brand. Nvidia is a little bit different, but you know, it's benefited from waves. It's not just you know gaming, but uh, you know, chips going to cryptocurrency mining now into to AI. So that's a bit of a different dynamic. Uh, yeah, Microsoft as well, um, yeah, Facebook, etc. Amazon, they're generally either um, yeah, benefiting from you know, the, the consumer in terms of distribution or advertising marketing and um, that's actually been holding up pretty well so we actually think it's probably a little bit of a lagging indicator. If the US economy softens, some of that big tech earnings might come under pressure and um, some of that leadership and concentration looks a bit more, bit more vulnerable. But um, you know, certainly tech as an area of growth does you know, continue to drive earnings for a lot of companies. Like We quite like companies here like you know, WiseTech which um, you know, is developing uh, a real global dominance in, in cross-border trade and logistics and shipping and, and software to support that. It's really cemented its position uh, with a lot of the freight forwarders and it's looking more to you know, move into to sea freight and land freight and cross-border customs and the like um, and you know, really cement that um, market position. It's got some great pricing power so um, as you see with other tech players like REA uh, or, uh, and the like, uh, even when volume slows, they can drive profits through through pricing power and, and lifting price. So those sort of companies with you know, strong barriers to entry, good pricing power, you know, global rollout opportunities, um, some real market dominance, you do uh, present an attraction. It's the sort of company that can continue to grow through a recession. It's not necessarily overly economically sensitive. Uh, a bit earlier, I was mentioning in that in that corporate news, A2 Milk, and it's a manufacturing partner there, Sinlay. Mm. Uh, there's opportunities re-emerging in China. On that topic, um, what's your China exposure at the moment? Well, particularly with those companies that are playing in that space. Yeah, it's a bit of a mix. Yeah, China's you know, very big exposure to the Aussie market through resources, so mm. bulk commodities, so um, you know, all the steel-making commodities, iron ore, BHP, Rio, Fortescue, etc. Um, but it's also um, part of this whole energy transition as well. Um, they you know, obviously buy a lot of um, you know, traditional sources, uh, oil and gas, uh, but also you know, incremental demand, not just from China, but I guess globally for things like lithium, copper, aluminium. So within that resources space, um, we actually think China's getting near to peak steel demand. Um, you know, you, the population's stopped growing, the um, you know, working age population started shrinking, there's still some more ur urbanisation to go, but the rate of growth there in terms of infrastructure development, new property, it's moving much more to a stabler phase where they're sort of uh, you know, redeveloping uh, older areas, uh, there's not you know, increasing demand for, for infrastructure, so that's probably peaking out. There, uh, there is speculation that the, uh, they'll look at some um, uh, stimulatory measures again in the property sector. Probably mainly because it's looking very weak at the moment. Yeah. So uh, they obviously really crunched that sector by tightening credit to um, their developers and sent a lot of them bankrupt, China Evergrande, etc. cetera. Mm. And the market's still recovering from that. So they've obviously eased um, credit availability there, mainly to get those developers to finish projects that, the, that are in the pipeline so that um, those that have bought off the plan, put their money up front, um, get something delivered. Uh, so they continue to support there, but uh, they've been reluctant to really drive big bang stimulus there because uh, I think they acknowledge that's not a sustainable growth path. They really want to stimulate consumption more. So you might see at the, you know, at the margin some you know, relaxation measures. Uh, the interesting thing in China though at the moment is uh, you know, households are looking to buy established properties more so than off the plan. Right. And there's a bit of a hole coming there and there's plenty of established apartments there. The pipeline for new construction looks uh, quite weak. So does that make you a little more cautious then, particularly as far as the cyclicals are concerned? Yeah, certainly um, bulk commodities, um, iron ore, um, looks like it's, it's had its best days. Um, it's been very strong in recent years, you know, really more to the dam collapse we saw in um, uh, Brazil uh, around Samarco a few years back, which really tightened the market um, up there. There's a big boost to demand through COVID with global manufacturing being, uh, being quite strong. That's starting to unwind now. So combination of slower uh, global manufacturing, goods demand peaking out, as well as that um, domestic property piece, um, you know, really um, hitting peak growth, sees us more cautious there. Would rather be in things medium term like uh, copper, aluminium, lithium, etc., where you've got some demand, not just from China in terms of you know, China at the margins, the big driver of uh, electric vehicle demand, but that's broadening out to the US and Europe, Australia, elsewhere, and that continues to drive demand for electrification, not just batteries, but um, grid um, electricity supply as well in terms of copper, aluminium, etc.